this section today on um, chapter four. Any questions? I thought you were going to get thrown a slammer or something. Oh, no, somebody stole something. Oh, really? Yeah. That's a bummer. What did you, what got stolen? Uh, my, uh, my soccer bag and uh, the stuff that I had in there. Hmm. I guess it was somebody from not campus, but like somebody in the area. But you were parked on campus? Yeah, I was parked on campus. That sucks. Last year, someone broke into my car and they just unwrapped the birthday gift from one of my friends and left it there. Just unwrapped the gift and left it there. And then left it on my seat. Must have been a real nice gift. <laughs> must have went all out. I'm glad it was a boy from the girl shirts. Happened on Friday. Mine was. I think mine was on Friday night. Okay, so um, we're uh, gonna we got a few more risks to uh, look at for the. Uh, individual banks running this business. So we have a list of about oh, I can't remember, six or seven of them. So managing credit risk is one thing. So screening and monitoring, specialization. What is screening? What, what are banks doing when they're screening? Uh, yeah, how do they do that? So checking how likely to, to pay it back. How are they doing that? Credit score, application, you know, the normal thing that we go through. So that kind of screening process is one way to manage credit risk. They don't know with certainty whether this person, of course, is going to be perfect in, in their paybacks, but that's what they can do. How does specialization help? Specialization in lending, what do you think is meant by that in terms of managing credit risk? Adam Smith, specialization is kind of our specialization in labor guy with the nations was one of the many contributions he made in the famous book. Specialization in lending. How could that help in terms of managing credit risk? That's all he does. Yeah, but what kind? But what would specialization in lending mean? One type of loan. Okay, and why would that help? What? Give me an example of a type of loan. Car loan. Let's just take car loan. Why might it help to specialize if you're a specialist in car loans? Somebody else add to the conversation here. Jordan, what are you thinking about with this? Specialization in lending in terms of managing credit risk. So it's brought up maybe a bank chooses to specialize in car loans. How, how, what kind of way would that maybe help in the idea of managing credit risk? To specialize in particular types of loans. Um, like yeah, I, that is, so you're, you're kind of giving the argument, so we, we, we saw some other advantages to this to diversify is one way of managing a different type of risk. But in terms of managing credit risk, the suggestion here is to maybe think about specializing in a loan. So it's kind of the opposite of diversification. But how would that add to managing credit risk in terms of how could we be put in a better position if we were to specialize? Okay, and how much you're right, and how might that be advantageous? And you can think about the car loan if you want or some other type of Yeah. So if, if you know the car the car industry and car loans, you start to kind of understand the consumer better potentially too, right? And also if you if you do the types of cars that they're using for federal, you know, maybe it's even down to what type of people typically buy red Corvettes. You know, maybe that's a risky thing. Just those Prince people who listen to Prince buy little red Corvette songs, and maybe those are riskier people, so we better watch out and get an extra extra amount down on them. I don't know. But there might be little nuances to different types of loans, credit cards, uh, cars, and so some banks might choose to specialize in a particular one. Um, it might be a little bit of a marketing thing maybe, that hey, we're the car loan specialist. Come to my bank ABC and we'll take care of you. We do a million car loans a month and our nearest competitor only does 500,000. We know car loans, right? So it might be, I don't know, maybe some sort of marketing thing too. Uh, but 
the marketing aspect wouldn't be in terms of managing credit risk. It would be more about managing the, the clients. Okay, any other last comments or questions there? Screening, specialization. We talked about developing these relationships so that there's that mutual trust back and forth. If the person feels like their banker is their friend, they will be less likely to screw them over, like not make their payment that month, or maybe when the, when the person's in trouble and they're thinking, oh, should I make this payment or this payment? Well, I really like People's Bank and I hate uh, Wells Fargo, so I'm gonna pay the People's Loan Bank first and if I have any money left over, I'll throw it at Wells Fargo, but they're kind of a big company and I hate them anyway, uh, especially since they took out extra loan app or online applications on my account. So long-term relationships, building up that trust might help. Um, credit rationing. What does it mean to get rationed? You can think back to maybe uh, World War II rations. What would that, what does, what does that mean? You have a limit, only a certain amount. So what would credit rationing be in the terms of a bank managing credit risk? Like the amount of money that they'll loan out to one particular customer at a time. Yeah. So they might say, hey, we're only, this guy's really credit worthy and he looks good on paper, but let's not, even though, you know, in theory the numbers support a million dollar loan, let's just not go more than 500,000. Right, we're going to kind of cap that to hedge their risk. It's, it's kind of a diversification, not putting all your eggs into one basket so that you got one customer that your that your loan portfolio really depends on. And if that if that customer goes down, then it's going to really put a dent in our portfolio. So uh, kind of a diversification thing there too. All right, uh, collateral just to be complete. What is collateral? When you put something else up for what's the other something else? The loan, right? So most car loans, your car serves as collateral for that loan. Um, if you were going to try to get a, a line of credit of 5,000 and the banker's like, well, I just don't want to give you a, an open line for 5,000, but I saw that you have that $15,000 boat. Do you got a loan against that boat? No, I don't have a loan against that boat. Well, why don't we use your boat as collateral for this $5,000 line of credit, right? So pledging another asset that's usually less liquid, uh, pledging that asset for a loan. So sometimes it's usually, like I said, the car that you buy, the car itself is the collateral for, for the loan you're doing. Or like with a house, it works the same way. But collateral can come in, in other forms too, that you can put other assets up for a, a loan that's not immediately um, uh, connected to the transaction. Uh, small businesses do this quite a bit with home equity. So if they want to get a business loan for their business, and they're in the business of selling uh, uh, euros and, uh, on Main Street from a euro cart, the banker might say, yeah, I'll give you a $50,000 loan, but we're going to use your house as collateral. Right? The house and the euro business doesn't have anything to do with each other, but you're placing some sort of asset up. Uh, as security and you don't pay your bills then potentially the lender can go after that that piece of collateral okay interest rate risk so variable rate loan means what a variable rate loan and it adjusts how often it depends, good answer. So you can get a one-year ARM, so ARM is the lingo we use, adjustable rate mortgage, ARM, a one-year ARM, a three-year ARM, a five-year ARM, so, and they can do a, a five-one ARM so that it's fixed for the first five years and then it adjusts every year thereafter. You can do a five-five ARM so that it's a five-year fixed and then it adjusts and it's fixed for another five years and then it's fixed for another five years. That's called a five-five ARM. But you can do a 5-1 arm, a 3-1 arm. So that, anyway, there's arms all over the place. But you've got some sort of variability to uh, the loan. 
And then, of course, we have fixed rate assets. So if you've got a 15-year fixed mortgage or a 30-year fixed mortgage, that interest rate isn't going to change. All right. So the bank has to think about the potential changes over time in their portfolio. And so with their balance sheet, if their assets and liabilities aren't quite matching up in size, they're exposing themselves to some risk. So, if this is our bank, First National, this is the same numbers that were just on the screen. If interest rates rise 5%, what will happen to bank profits? If interest rates rise 5%, what happens? Decrease. How much? And why? What are assets for the bank? The loans. We can kind of just think loans. Interest rates go up, banks getting screwed, or it's good for the bank? That's good. Liabilities of the bank. What are the liabilities? Checking account deposits, savings deposits. Now these are on the fixed rate side, but some of the variable rate liabilities at 50 million. Interest rates go up, bank gets screwed or bank likes it. Bank gets screwed. So that's the tension that arises. <laughs> now, if these two things were equal, 50 million, 50 million, what happens to the bank's vulnerability? It's a wash, right? $50 million worth of stuff to the good 5% to the bad 5%. Wait, I said that backwards, right? Good, bad. So things wash out. But if we have it not proportional, we're, we're opening up some interest rate risk. Does anybody have an idea what we might be able to do with these numbers here to calculate what might happen? 5% uh, interest rate, 20 million with assets, 50 million with liabilities. We got a 5% increase in interest rates. How much exposure do we have? What happens to bank profits? This question right here. What happens to profit? And I'm looking for a number this time not just a direction. And you can just tell me how to do it. You don't even need to pull out your calculator if you don't want. Let's think about the loan side. You guys said that this, this works to their benefit or detriment? Benefit, right? So. The bank has $20 million out in loans. If interest rates go up 5%, if interest rates go up 5%, how much additional interest income are they going to be collecting? One million, Zach, how'd you get that? Uh, it's what? One, 20th is up? 5%, 5% right? 5%. Okay. So 5%, 10% is 2 million, 5% is 1 million, right? So we got $1 million worth of interest here to the good or to the bad? Good. To the good. However, people who have money at our bank have 50 million out times the 5%. 10% would be 5. 5% would be 2.5 to the good or to the bad? 1.5 million, right? So that's kind of a quick and dirty way using a weighted average of our balance sheet. Take 5% of your assets, 5% of your liabilities, 1.5 million. Now if interest rates drop by 5%, you're 1.5 million to the good. Just the opposite, right? So, but the bank's 
aren't necessarily in business to play the interest rate risk game. They usually like a little more certainty, but they will play it from time to time. And so they might have a boardroom meeting that says, hey, let's start, uh, let's start hedging our bet a little or that way, depending on what we think interest rates are going to do. They usually don't play that game in a big way, but they do play it in a smaller way for most commercial banks because they tend to be conservative. But as the economy starts to loosen up and banking regulations get looser, uh, depending on the owners of the bank and their taste for risk, they might play this little interest game a little bit more. All right, any questions or comments there? All right, so here's the gap. This is, this is um, a short formula. <clears throat> rate sensitive assets minus rate sensitive liabilities times the interest rates. That's what we just did, right? We took the 5% change. We had 20 million minus 50 million. And then that gave us the change in bank profit of, of 1.5 million to the negative. So we just did this calculation, not quite the same way that this is laid out but that's called gap analysis. So when you get more sophisticated with this, then we're gonna care about whether there's a three month duration, six month duration, one year duration, and so it gets a little more complicated bringing in maturities to it. Uh, but they're gonna have kind of this big formula that does some of that math to hedge their, hedge their bets. <clears throat> so adding the duration on, the percent change in the value of a security. Now that's changing things on you a little bit, right? So for holding securities, as part of our assets, in addition to loans, so the market value of the security is a rule of thumb, that's why we got this equal sign in quotes, the negative of the percentage point change in the interest rate, so interest rates fell by 50 basis points. 50 basis points is how, many, how much interest? Does I remember that from about three weeks ago? 50 basis points. 50 basis points half a percent. So it's just, we kind of use that lingo, but 50 up to 100. So 100 is one basis point, or 100 basis points is 1%. So if we have a 50 basis point percentage change, uh, we can calculate that and do this estimation with the number of years, and that will give us the roughly the percentage change in the market value of our portfolio. All right, so you'll have a couple homework problems to apply your knowledge there. Off balance sheet. So, the income. So does anybody know what servicing mortgage-backed securities is? MBS's mortgage-backed securities. So this had something to do with the financial crisis. Remember what mortgage-backed security is, Jack? Well, insurance mortgage-backed securities, that when the bank sells security, that's Kind of. One more step in the chain, though. So when, when, the, when the bank sells it, they group up a whole bunch of mortgage, right? And so then that security, the value of that security might have a thousand mortgages in it. And that's the security. It's a mortgage-backed security because all of the thousand houses that are in this little bundle all have mortgages behind them. So it's a mortgage-backed financial security, and now I can sell that to some Wall Street broker and or somebody on Wall Street, either in the primary market or the secondary market, and now that can be bought and sold. 
the mortgage-backed security. And then it gets deeper from there. We'll watch that video eventually here again about, about breaking it into the different levels of risk. Um, but this is what I wanted to highlight is the service servicing. We sell the loan to Wall Street, but it still might be serviced locally. What would it mean to service the loan? Collecting on it, that's right. So the, the client still writes their mortgage check to people's bank, right? And so for me, this is, this is what really ticked people off in the mortgage industry before is that, oh, they sold my loan and now I've got a new bank and a new bank. And sometimes people would have, they're writing checks to different banks multiple times. Um, so with the, with the advent of the mortgage-backed security and then separating the servicing of the loan from the loan itself, they're like, hey, I don't really care who gets the check. You can get a little bit of a cut for servicing the loan. And so the little grandma brings in her check to the bank and says, here's my payment, honey. And okay, we'll credit your account. And they, the bank has to take that in, $1,000 into granny's account and make sure it gets shipped off to whoever holds that mortgage-backed security ultimately. So it's just the processing of the loan. And then it allowed the uh, local banks to maintain that customer service, which we learned was important from the last slide on, on managing customer relationships so that they don't feel like they're just a commodity. Oh, come in here and you're just going to sell my loan anyway. You don't care about me. Well, we tricked them by keeping the servicing. Yes, we don't care about you, but we're going to pretend like we do. So we're going to continue to, to service them. Okay, any questions on this part here? Secondary loan participation, what is it? When you see the word secondary in this class, what does that mean? Secondary market. Matt? Person to person, so not like primary market where it's usually like company. Uh, initial investor. The initial investor, right? So with the stock market, we had the, the company actually getting the funds from the primary sale, the initial sale of stock. But afterwards, it's just a marketable security that can be bought and sold every day. All right. Um, more off balance sheet. So these are some activities that, depending on your charter and your bank, you can maybe get into. Um, we're, the next chapter we get into is going to talk about some of the banking laws and, and regulations and restrictions and how that's evolved over time. There was a, uh, a thought previously that to keep people's money safe, Let's just have the bank do a limited number of activities with the deposits. Like, okay, I get it, house loans, car loans, that's cool, let's do that. But let's not allow the banks to use deposits to go buy interest rate swaps or use people's deposits to speculate on foreign exchange currency, on, on foreign exchange speculation in the market. So that some of those activities were limited and then through the pendulum swinging the other way uh, and loosening up those regulations, the banks started to cry, well, it's not fair that Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, they need competition and maybe we should, we have enough know-how and with you looking over our shoulder, we'll be okay. We'll, we'll let you know when we're buying stuff like this, but uh, we, we want to participate in that market. So they kind of made the argument that they could get involved in um, at the time, non-traditional type investments. All right, and we'll kind of expand on that uh, as well. Principal agent problem, what's that? Principal agent. Yeah, possibly the higher up, so um, the uh, principal agent, that Wells Fargo example, maybe there was something to do with the, the higher ups versus the incentives for the employees uh, doing it. It might have been because of the way their pay scheme was structured. Might be one example. 
in general, it's just the person who owns whatever it is, the owner of the property directly, doesn't have people working for him or her that carry out things the way that they would see them carried out. And so maybe through different structures of pay and other things, we can, we can help the principal agent problem, and maybe in some cases we can't. But acknowledging that the incentives of the agent don't always line up with uh, desired outcomes of the principal. All right. So after they successfully lobbied to participate in some of these non-traditional activities, they started to say, okay, we're going to let you do 10% of your portfolio at most can be done in interest rate hedging or foreign exchange speculation or whatever, right? So we start to come up with rules on, on uh, ways to limit how much of that might be going on if it ends up being risky for uh, the bank. Stress testing is some simulations that say, suppose interest rates change by 5%. What happens to this bank's balance sheet? Are they screwed or do they work through it, right? So we kind of set up an artificial uh, uh, simulation, sometimes called a Monte Carlo simulation, of running them through different scenarios to see how well uh, the numbers shake out if something negative happens. All right, questions or comments there? All right, that is chapter four. Four, nine. <laughs> four was on my head. All right, so we're jumping over to chapter 11. So chapter nine, I drove the focus into individual bank. How do they make money? What are some of the things that they're uh, exposed to? And now we're gonna take one step back and look at the banking industry and uh, how they are interrelated between each other. So banks have uh, kind of a relatively youthful history, at least with the Federal Reserve. Look through each of those dates. So when did our nation start again, roughly? Constitution time frame, Declaration of Independence? 1776, and the Constitution was actually put together 1787, I think you're right. 87, so already at this time, our nation is really young, right? And so they're like, oh, we got to have a banking system. Let's start a bank. Fail, 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 fail. The, bank, the whole idea of a kind of the central bank collapsed because people were pretty fearful about too big of a government. That was, wasn't their thing. They're like, we want to kind of run our own show. So we, you know, we had the, the United States of America. We wanted to drive more power into the states, right? So less, uh, less at the federal level, more at the individual level. And so that's why we went... Uh, a long period of time before we got to the Federal Reserve, 1913, just a little over 100 years old. So the Central Bank of the United States is fairly, fairly young, and some people would still like to see it be abolished um, and, and move towards, uh, move away from an income tax. That would be me. I'm, I'm one of those people, and I think the United States would be a better place if we just had a sales tax in place. 
and got rid of the income tax altogether. And on the IRS, it might morph into some other sort of policing entity, but the IRS as we know it for collecting income tax, uh, I don't think is the best system for the, for the United States. So there's let hold those views. In fact, uh, I didn't know this until now that the libertarian candidate, Gary Johnson, who is not on stage as near as I can tell tonight, right? He didn't get 15% of the vote or whatever, but uh, he was in favor of the fair tax, which those of you ahead of me for macro might remember the fair tax was the is the consumption tax plan. And so he's kind of put that forward. Um, so I don't know if we'll ever get to that, to that possibility, but where we stand today, we've got um, income tax, and we also have the uh, Federal Reserve as our as our central bank. Um, so uh, then, 1933, we get this Glass Steagall Act and the FDIC. Now, what was happening in the 30s? Great Depression. So that's what started to shape the foundation of of uh, well, maybe this. A little centralized government ideas, maybe, maybe that, maybe there's something there. People started dabbling with that a little bit more, and so uh, that's when these entities started getting uh, established. Okay, questions or comments on the timeline? Just to get kind of a feel of what the industry has looked like, and then I've got the video, which I think is I got a link to the video next to here. Oh no, no, I don't. Let me see, is that my video? Oh, there it is. Coming up. It's going to be video day today. All right, Federal Reserve, state banking system. Fed also regulates bank holding companies. Those are other um, entities that are set up for the bank owners, basically. So one of the reasons the Federal Reserve got some traction was that we had the 12 Federal Reserve banks spread out so people kind of like that they said the perception of, of something uh, of something with some competition all right so uh, I got this recording from uh, NPR it's kind of interesting uh, so I'm going to play this it's eight minutes long and is the answer to bad behavior more government regulation in other words, we get a bad behavior, we need another rule. Bad behavior, another rule. Bad behavior, another rule. And this was an interview from a couple of years ago. If it's still got a link. Yep, it is. So my friend Dion comes from Whole Foods Market, where yellow signs identify featured items throughout stores each week, from grass fed burgers to gluten-free buns. Whole Foods Market. National Public Media. What's the deal with the commercial? A former employee reported meetings involving officials from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. In them, you hear officials considering how to oversee Goldman Sachs. <laughs> Legal but shady, says a Fed official of a financial transaction. We hear much more of that reporting in a moment. These reportings were made by Carmen Segarra in 2012. At the time, she was a New York Fed banking examiner, and she felt the Fed was going too easy on a powerful and very well connected investment bank. She was later fired. She stayed in the Fed, and this makes news. What we're revealing for the first time is that Sagara secretly recorded 46 hours of meetings. She gave those recordings to an investigative reporter from ProPublica and to the public program This American Life, which will play the next night for this weekend. Reporter Jake Bernstein is with us. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Uh, just so we have it on the table here, what is the concern that is being raised by these recordings? Is some kind of massive corruption? There's, there's, there's no corruption here where where people are being passed uh, wads of cash and not to do their job. This is really what people s describe as, as regulatory capture, this idea that uh, the regulators are, are too cozy with the banks that they're actually building. So they're not pushing hard enough for this and things that concern them. Legal but shady transactions, to use that phrase, 
And it's completely understandable. These are people who work inside the banks. They, they see these people every day, and they need to obtain information from these banks. And it's easier to obtain the information if you're friendly and uh, if you have a good relationship. But sometimes that can slide to, to deference. So one of these people who's examining Goldman Sachs was Carmen Cigar. Carmen Cigar is a lawyer. Uh, she had about 15 years of experience uh, helping banks comply with rules and regulations. And then after the financial crisis, uh, she applied for a job at the New York Fed because she says that she wanted to do something that would sort of help uh, the financial system and help prevent these kinds of things from happening in the future. Okay, so she comes there at a time when the country is focused on stricter regulation of financial institutions and the dangers of financial institutions that get out of control. She's in the Fed for a few months and she gets involved in one particular deal. We heard that reference to that deal that was described in the table as legal and shitty. What was it? Yeah, this, this deal shows up in discussions throughout her case. It was a deal between Goldman Sachs and a Spanish bank called Banco Santander. And Santander was being required by its regulator in Europe to, uh, to hold more cap of a cushion in case uh, you know, things go wrong. Well, this has been a big deal since the financial crisis. The institutions are supposed to have the equivalent of cash on hand in case of a crisis. Exactly. And so what Goldman was doing was they were taking some of the assets off of Santander's books. They were going to hold them for a few years to let Santander hold less capital. Okay, so this transaction is happening. Carmen Cigara, among other people at the Fed, find out about it. And this is a point where Carmen Cigara is already questioning the strength of her colleagues at the Fed, the strength of their effort to oversee Goldman, and she's making recordings, which we're about to play some of one. What's on this? Uh, we're about to listen to Mike Silva. He's the head Fed official inside Goldman Sachs. And uh, he wants to question uh, Goldman executives about this deal and, and ask some sharp questions. He's got, he's got some concerns. My own personal opinion. Thank you, Yes, Sanira says that she saw this a lot, that there was a fear 
aware that if you push COVID too far, they wouldn't give information to the Fed, which she didn't understand because Goldman is obligated to give information to the Fed when it has to. Okay, now Carmen Tierra, we should say, has since been fired from the Fed. She sued, saying that she was fired because she was considered too Now, what is the Fed saying about her case, and what is Goldman saying about her case? The Fed says that the decision to terminate uh, Sierra's employment was based entirely on performance grounds and not for any concerns that she raised about Goldman Sachs in her examination. Goldman Sachs says the concerns that Sierra raised in her examination were off base. I want to emphasize that even though you have dozens of hours of recordings here, secret recordings, what you have is a snapshot in time. Uh, of an incredibly difficult and long-running job of regulating banks. So I just want to want to ask you, Jay Bernstein, is there anyone besides Carmen Cigar the one who made these recordings who says the Fed has just been too gentle on the banks? Uh, actually, the Fed, the, the Commission announced that report in 2009 that said that the biggest problem with the Fed was its own culture, the deference, the fear of speaking up, and uh, suggested that they hire uh, expert examiners who would stop them and contradict their bosses, people like Ron Sierra. Jake, thanks very much. Thank you. That's important, Jake Bernstein. Okay, questions of that. Yeah, a little bit, right? It seems like the, the tail wagging the dog type thing in, in general. So Goldman seems to have a little bit of, of power. Um, so what was the what was their argument? The Fed officials that Carmen didn't totally agree with, the Mike Silver, her boss here. <coughs> what was their thinking? That they were too aggressive with Goldman, that they want to tell the Fed and stuff. Yeah, so they thought they would like get more information out of them if they if they weren't too prying, I guess, into their details. So, and what was the argument back to that? They're obligated, They're obligated to anyway. So, um, you know, what would be the problem? So this is where uh, the public choice theory and economics kind of comes into play is to think think about Carmen and Mike for that matter being like real human beings, not being the government. You know, how do real human beings when they're put into that role that they're in as an auditor and a making sure that rules are being followed, um, what are some natural human biases that come in when you're put into that position? How do you how do you play the game? What what's in your private incentive to be like? Want their own like best for them personally. Yeah, and so what's best for them is is it usually fun to create a environment where it's real hostile and and con, uh, conflict and confrontation oriented. No, right. So on that human level, they don't really want to go in and just be a holes and hated. Right? Who wants to go to work every day and be hated and be the, the one that's the bearer of bad news? Now, there are a couple personalities like that, right? You, can, you guys might know some people that might really enjoy that job. But for the most part, you're not going to get your whole labor force to, to be like that. And maybe we don't want them to completely be like that. So it's kind of natural that they might start to get a little cozy. Of course, Goldman. Uh, do you think they have a small expense account or a large expense account for for dinners and you know entertainment? So do you think there's a chance that they treat their auditors pretty nice when they come in and you know they get a nice dinner and maybe they take them out for dinner later that night? Hey, I got I happen to have a couple extra tickets to the New York Mets game tonight. The Yankees are in town. I see uh, Sheldon's got the Yankee shirt on. Oh, you like the Yankee Sheldon? Why don't you and the family? I got these extra tickets. They're just burning a hole in my pocket. Uh, why don't you take the kids out to Yankee Stadium? They're not very good seats. They're a little off the, like, four rows back on the third baseline. So you're 
you know, you probably, probably won't like them very much, but nonetheless, you can get a hot dog or something, right? So that's the game that's played here, and so it shouldn't be completely out of the question to learn that uh, it's not, it's easier said than done to just police something. Like, we need the government to do more of this. And the more, the more invasive, the more maybe confrontational, but that's not even the word I'm really looking for. But the deeper that the government uh, gets into their books and their transactions and stuff, what does it do for the costs of the private company that's going in? The deeper that they get with more regulations, more do this, more do that, what happens to the cost of doing business? They go up, right? And so now we're starting to add on that. So from a cost-benefit analysis, um, as an economist thinking of it, from the public good standpoint too as the government, I don't want to make it so costly that it's not worth the benefit. In other words, if Goldman is a completely straight shooting, honest, and doing great business, sparkling clean record, you know, they don't, of course, perfect record, but let's just say that they do, then in theory, I, I as government don't have to look at them as close, right? That there should be a, a little bit level of trust. In other words, it's kind of wasted resources to impose costs that aren't really needed, that there's no benefit for. From a, co from a marginal benefit, marginal cost standpoint, it's a waste of resources from from an economy-wide basis here, that's not as simple as saying, oh, just throw more government at them. More government means more costs, and if there's no benefit of reduced bad behavior, then it truly was a complete waste of resources. And so we don't want to do that either. So that, that's kind of the, the balancing act, and I think that's part of what these guys were saying here, um, but they have to continue to work hard to try to see what the right, uh, the right mix is. Uh, more bank capital, that was early on. What was that? It's coming out of the financial crisis. More bank capital, this is more just a review of what we did last time. More bank capital, assets minus liabilities equals owner's equity. More bank capital, Zach. More cash on hand. So they said that here, and so more cash on hand means less loaned out, right? So it's a safer place to be, but again, not going to make as much money. It's not something. It's kind of counter to uh, profit maximization um, if it's not if it's too much money to be held back. All right, we'll call it a day there.